first off, I'd like to say thank you to our wonderful sponsors. Why don't we give them a round of applause for making this happen? Scaled, Closer IQ, Sales Loft, Square Foot, and Splash. Um, I'm Evan Bartlett. I'm a co-host of Building the Sales Machine. Uh, my day job is I run the inside sales team here at ZocDoc. Uh, thank you, ZocDoc, for hosting us in this, in this wonderful space. And um, I want to say thank you to our co-hosts as well. So we've got Dave Greenberger, Eric Friedman, and Sam Jacobs, uh, who also make Sales Machine happen. And then most importantly, I wanted to say thank you to Kara Silverman, who's in the back. Thank you, Kara. She's our event coordinator, and she made today happen. And she's uh, made it incredibly easy for us to, to pull this off. So um, today we're going to speak with Josh McBride. And uh, I'll give kind of the, the 10 second intro because we want to get into the details of his past experiences. But Josh and I met uh, about five years ago at a tech event like this where people were primarily speaking about fundraising and product and kind of all the sexy stuff in the startup world. No one was talking about revenue. He was the VP of sales of Cheetah Mail and he was growing a sales machine from two, three, four, five million to 100, 180 million. Um, and I hadn't come across a lot of people who'd built uh, sales to that, to that extent. So we became friends. I'd pick his brain on a lot of these topics, and I felt this would be the perfect forum to kind of jump right into it um, and talk to Josh. Cool. This so this thanks, works. Josh, for coming and joining us. Um, we've got a couple categories of questions. We're going to ask some questions that might be interesting to founders, some questions that are interesting to sales leaders, sales managers, and then uh, some sellers because Josh... Uh, was a seller as well. So let's get right into it. Um, as someone who's worked at a couple different startups and, and is now building your own, what do you think the most important thing for a founder to know about sales is as they get into a kind of a sales-heavy company? Uh, well, let's see. So the the, 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 the first two companies, so Cheetahmail, um, the next company I worked at, OfferPop, they were both at around a million in, in revenue, so certainly was was already kind of getting the wheels going. Um, relative to, to Upside or my current business, I think the, um, you know, when and how to, to get into, like, how you should start selling, I think the the the, the key thing for, for, for me, at least, is, is, like, in many ways, we're still kind of figuring out what we want to be um, to, to the world. So... Having um, very detailed conversations with potential clients, um, picking their brains, asking the right questions, I think is is very critical to us. I um, I couldn't imagine right now hiring a salesperson because I think the 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 conversations that you have with very early clients, it's just it's too critical. Like there's too much information that you miss uh, or doesn't get translated to um, back to me or back to another co-founder. If there's an intermediary in the process, while we're we're still figuring it out, so I very much think like you know you're you're founding a business. I, I think you know tens the most founders tend at least the tech companies tend to be developers, engineers, in, in, non sales, and I think it's difficult for them to get into that environment. Um, but it, it's critical, and it 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 can't be outsourced. Um, like you have to get in the weeds because there's just so much product that that feedback that you need to get. I mean, so you're a fan of, of founder selling, get out there, do it yourself first. Yeah. I mean, I think like if, if I, and, and, and we also over the last year have had an opportunity to work with a lot of founders and a lot of like people looking to hire their first salesperson. And what we tend to see like work well is, is when the startup has the founders lead the first probably dozen to two dozen um, closed deals where they're actually paying because if you think about it, if it's, let's say it's 12 deals, 10% win rate, you're talking to 120 potential clients. And that's, you know, 100 no's and you learn a lot from that, that process. So I, I think like for me, it's, it's getting to that point. And then it's like, okay, now I have a sense of what the sales process is, what um, it's repeat, somewhat repeatable. So I could hire someone, I could basically tell them what they need to do. Um, and have some confidence level with it and, you know, see how they do. Cool. And I, I think that's probably the, the second most asked question we get from founders is when you should hire your first 
salesperson, kind of how and when do you think that companies should be thinking about taking that step? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, I think a dozen to two dozen paying clients is, is pretty critical. Uh, having a sense of, of the objections you're going to get. And then you also have a sense from a, a pricing perspective. Uh, so another thing a lot of times you're trying to figure out is what is your product worth? How much can you charge? Who are you selling it to? Uh, and then as part of that process, it's going to give you information in terms of what type of candidate or what type of salesperson you should be looking at hiring. Um, we see a lot of, lot of lot, not saying a lot, but a decent amount of like mismatching. It's like, okay, we have uh, a handful of clients. Like, I think we know our sales process. We need, you know, someone with a couple years experience to go in there. But reality is it's an enterprise product and it's going to take six months to sell. And there's just this mismatch because they hire someone who has, uh, you know, is coming from a more transactional background and there's just this, mis this mismatch. So what ends up happening is they, they lose three to six months, depending on how long it, it takes them to, to let that person go before they recalibrate. And we were, like, we were just in a meeting two days ago where, where that was the case. They just missed. And he's like, look, I, I spent way too much money. We're behind. Like, I really wished I would have sold longer and then made the right decision to hire. And, and, and that's just a very big reoccurring theme in, in a lot of the, 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 the founders that, that I have an opportunity to engage with. So you're saying is basically match the profile of that first salesperson to the, to the product in the sales cycle you're seeing. Can you talk us through what that was for Cheetah Mail, which I think was on the, the enterprise sale, and then OfferPop? which was more transactional, I wouldn't say SMB, but maybe more mid-market. Yeah, totally. And, and I think with, with Cheetah Mail, like, team was there, joined, it was a sales rep. So I, um, OfferPop, there was a handful of reps, and we kind of built that from five to about 65. Um, but, but the Cheetah side was very much enterprise. We had a very, uh, from the very beginning, we decided that we G were going to Give a to be quick snippet on Cheetah Mail. I'm not sure everyone no, knows. True, it's it's a bit old school. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> what's Cheetah Mail? So, uh, so Cheetah Mail is a company that was started in, in about 1998, 99, and it was and is an email marketing platform. And uh, uh, it, 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 I, funny enough, like, I, like it's some peop many people have heard the name, but they don't realize the size and scale. Like it, you know, it, it was acquired, we were acquired in 2004 by a company called Experian, um, but we, they kind of left us alone. We were headquartered in New York. We took the business from you know, million, or, you know, zero to 250 million globally in annual revenue. They do about 300 million right now. Um, very large employer in, in New York. I think the, the business has never had someone that's like out in the, in the uh, community championing like causes and coming to events like this. So very, people actually, very few people actually know the story. But the reality is um, we were very focused from early on on the enterprise. As we looked in the market, we felt that, um, you know, we, we charged money. People paid us when they sent emails. And the more you send, the more we make. So it's like, all right, well, let's just target all the largest email senders. And they primarily happen to be the large retailers. So you walk down a mall and, you know, pretty much work with eight out of ten of those, those companies, large banks, publishers, um, et cetera. And so it was an enterprise sell. Um, uh, very quickly... The sales were six figures into multi seven figure deals, and the product was really geared to the complexities of an enterprise business. Um, so the sales team, what that meant for a sales team is we we had no intentions to go mid market. Um, they still don't. They're still very focused on the enterprise. So when you think about a target market, total addressable market, and then sizing a sales org organization to that, uh, we never really needed more than 20, you know, maybe 25 salespeople to do $30 million in, 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 annual, um, in annual bookings. And, uh, you know, so it was very focused. So, but, the, but the sales process was long. We know we needed people who are experienced in that, that process. Um, and that's, you know, we, we kind of kept it at that level. Um, OfferPop, on the other hand, uh, is a social marketing platform now called Wing, W-Y-N-G. They changed their name. Um, and uh, the, uh, so that was a little bit different of a model. So that was more mid-market up to enterprise. So that was an organization and just personally excited me because it was an opportunity to go in and build a large, uh, a large sales organization. It's 2012. 
uh, social marketing, social media was what AI and uh, you know all that drones and all that stuff is today. So, um, you know, it allows it to go in there and, and hire very quickly. And I think the profiles were very different. OfferPop, we were doing 5K deals all the way up to 20, 30, 40, 50K, but it allowed us to go at a, at a, different, uh, a, different, uh, a different profile. So get the founders to sell, figure out the sales process, and then hire sellers that meet that profile. Um, I think that's a good, some good takeaways on the founder side of things. Um, to shift gears a little bit, you know, we're gonna move towards questions geared for sales leaders, right? Let's say you're a little bit further in the process, you've hired either a VP of sales or a sales director to manage those five, 10 AEs. Um, based on your experiences, when have you, I guess, how, when is the right time to scale? I think people raise money and get that pressure almost immediately. What do you think the right time is uh, based on those two organizations you worked for? Yeah, and I, I think it's um, you know, probably OfferPop is is uh, is, a, is probably the best example of that. And I think because we really put the pedal to the metal, and I think a couple things need to happen. Number one is is you know if you're going from a handful of reps called three to five, and you're going to double or triple quadruple the sales team, like number one, you better have your sales process fairly baked um, as you're going to be adding a lot of volume to the to the team. And then I think as you go about scaling. Um, and there's like some things that we did very well and some things we did not do very well. Um, but as you scale, like I think it's really important to go through the exercise of doing the, the uh, total addressable market. Um, how do you get there, right? Like if I'm going from five reps to 15 reps, what like it's not just enough to, do, you know, have your uh, C, uh, CFO say, hey, we need to go from, 5 million in sales to 15 million in sales, so we're gonna, you know, 3X the sales team. Um, you have to also go bottoms up. And I think that's something that we, um, we didn't do early enough, um, but certainly we, we, we did, you know, later down the road in the sense that, like, if you are gonna hire 10 more salespeople, where do their leads come from? Who generates them? Is the market big enough? Are there, are there enough leads to, 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 to support 10 more salespeople? Uh, I think these are all questions that sometimes are difficult to answer and sometimes you kind of have to have to guesstimate a bit, but it's super, super important to have that have that data and and map that from from both sides perspective. And and I've just seen just from you know paying attention to the industry, there have been a lot of businesses that have primarily around series B that raise a bunch of money that want the the chart to kind of keep going like this. And it's like, okay, we're gonna we're just gonna like, you know, quadruple the sales team. And it turns out the math is wrong, and uh, you see, you know, a lot of layoffs. Some CEOs are not CEOs anymore. Like, you know, it's, it, it's because, like, I look at it, it's like, shit, they didn't do the bottoms up measure. So, so step through that bottoms up. Like, what things are you going to check just so people kind of walk away understanding um, what, what level of detail, what type of information would you be back? Like, what math are you doing? Yeah, so I think um, if we, we think about OfferPop back in the day, it's, it's like how, how big is the market? Who are we targeting? How many, how many companies is that, right? Um, you know, of those companies, you know, there's only a certain percentage of them that will be evaluating a product at any given time. Probably the earlier the product, the more evaluation. But, like, you know, if you think about, just to jump a bit, but think about email marketing now, like that's, that's a pretty mature platform, so there's only so many people that are looking at any given time, right? So how big is that market? And then the next question is like, as, you, as a salesperson sits down, and I always think of it, of it backwards, of like, okay, I've got to hit a, a million dollars in sales by the end of the year as, a, as an individual contributor. Well, okay, how many deals do I need to close? How many opportunities do I need? And ultimately bake it back to like, how many cl clients do I, or how many accounts do I need to reach out to to be able to hit that number? And, uh, and then the, the, you know, and then like the second part of that is, is like who's responsible for what, right? So is the sales team responsible for 100% of their own leads or is marketing signing up for some? Is there a, a BDR team that's signing up for some? And what does, what does that look like as well? What are their metrics? And, you know, pretty much going down to like weekly, monthly um, lead all the way to, to close metrics. Like I think you have to go through that exercise. And there's a little bit of, you know, guessing, not guessing, but a little bit of estimating in there. But, um, you know, it's just, it's just super important to do. I mean, and those are all the metrics that, 
um, that we look at now for our business in a variety of different ways. Um, you know, as I have an opportunity to consult with different businesses, like I've got enough spreadsheets and enough like, hey, just fill this out and we'll help you understand kind of what to do. But, you know, certainly that comes with a lot of trial and error. Um, you made another comment about making sure your sales process is, is mildly baked or, or fully baked before you, you kind of ramp things up. What does that mean? I think we hear that a lot from a lot of different people that speak at, at Sales Machine. What does that mean for you? What are some of the things that indicate to you that the process is a little more mature or at least? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like when you, you know, think of the steps of the sales process, when you get on the phone with someone, do you know what questions to ask them in discovery? When they answer them, do you know how to, you know, to an extent, know how to respond to them? Something that when you, when you bring a salesperson into the organization, uh, and in my experience, it's, it's, it's not impossible, but it's difficult to find someone who's going to come in and help you figure all that stuff out. I think they want, like, you know, salespeople want to make money and they want to kind of go. And uh, I think the further that you can get them in terms of knowing what to, what to do, I think is, um, is super, super important. So especially, like, if you're, like, you're a sales leader, you have five people, right? Like, that's enough where you know, the sales leader is typically in that environment also a seller and is, is, is typically savvy enough to go in and close deals and help the reps kind of get over the finish line. But as you go to 15, you're, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. So once you start seeing separation from the time you're able to spend on a per rep basis, that's when it's like, okay, I really need to start introducing process. And do they know how to go through the, the steps? Do they know what to ask? Do they know how to respond? Because um, if not, then I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it in the metrics see it in the win rate, I'll see it in the conversion rates of the sales process. Cool. Um, shifting gears again, I think another question we get from people that are running organizations that are kind of right in the middle of the pack where they're, where they're starting to get a larger team size, 20, 30 sellers, um, comp, right? Comp comes up, how do you do it? How do you get it right? What are some of the common mistakes? Um, how do you think about those comp plans and kind of the early part of your organization? Yeah, I mean, and <laughs> I mean, I've, I've had that opportunity. I've, I've probably ended up, like, I've put together no less than 10 comp plans this year for various um, companies. Um, so I have more experience uh, in the last 12 months than I have in, in, uh, in my career, actually. Um, but, uh, but I think the way, like, I've, I've, I've talked to founders or I've, I've thought about it myself is, is like, look, it, it, you have to incent the behavior that you want to see. And I think early stage... Like, well, we don't know what our quota should be. We don't know what our, our you know, we don't know enough about it. So, which is fine, but I think it's, it's so what do you actually want to see happen? Do you want high quality meetings? Do you, want, um, do you want deals that progress to a certain stage? Do you want, you know, do the discovery, get it to a point where a founder could jump on, on, the, on the meeting? This is like for very early stage startups, right? So, so thinking about the behavior, because, you know, what I found is I've tested a lot of different things and like, the two things that I know will happen in, in every instance is when I put that plan together, the sales team, like, and power to them, I was the same way when I was a seller, like, they're going to figure out the, the way to game it, right? Like, and how do I maximize the amount of money I can make with the least amount of work that I can make? And you should be thinking that way because that's, that's why you're doing what you're doing in, in many ways. So I think, like, it's, you know, it's incentivizing the right behavior. Um, what I've learned is, is, like invest a tremendous, like if you think you should invest like, I don't know, two days working on a comp plan, invest like two weeks and go through a scenario analysis. Um, try to think about it. Have other people in your organization look at it. Have, you know, there's a great community that's part of, of this, this event. Like have other people look at it because they're going to poke holes in it. And because what I found is like, is like, you, you know, people will, will, will game it. But then the second thing is like, if you make a, even a kind of, not a small, but like a, a medium, like a small medium change to a comp plan, if you're a large enough, it's going to ripple. Like you're going to be dealing with a, a lot of headaches for a very long time. And potentially to the point, like if you're making a change and it's having an impact on a top performer, that might be enough for that top performer to, uh, you know, to, to say like, I'm, I'm out of here. So yeah. invest the time up front so you don't yeah, have totally, to deal with the changes. Totally. What... Um, let's, let's pick a specific example. So what is something that you wish you had known earlier or wish you had done earlier 
at either Cheetah Mail or OfferPop, that turned out to be a big pain in terms of how you design those comp plans. I think <laughs> uh, one scenario that um, where we didn't do as much homework as, as we should have is, is we were morphing the team at, the, at, at OfferPop in particular, where we were, we were at, I want to say, like 30 to 45 salespeople. And we wanted to create this structured, uh, more tiers within the organization. So it's instead of just having BDRs and, and account executives, we wanted a, a corporate level and then a senior level. So we, we put plans together that, you know, hey, kick ass, do what you do, and then you'll be promoted to this next level. Um, <laughs> We ended up not doing enough like math exercises on the like okay if I hit close two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars in Q two, I will end up making thirty five dollars less than I will if I'm the next level up, and there were like these really small edge cases that we that we just missed and the team was all over and although like in 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 the bigger picture like someone who is promoted would, like, if they crush, they'll make significantly more money. But they, you know, hung up on, well, what if I close 216K? It's like, well, close 300, like, don't. But, um, but, you know, and this was like, this is, again, like, me not doing enough homework on it. And, uh, you know, we got over it and we survived. But it was, um, you know, it was a good lesson um, because it, you know, it sucked time on meeting with people. So they're saying, like, uh, uh, why get promoted? I'm going to make exactly, less well, exactly. in, the next, in the next tier of salesperson under this new comp plan. Or I want to get promoted, but I want a better plan because of this one, like, $10,000 ban of, of bookings. Like, that scenario. So, um, so do your homework. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. And then uh, to shake things up a little bit, I'm going to take a question from the audience. And then we'll go back to, to mine. So I'll ask one more. And then we'll... We'll see uh, what you guys can come up with. As you start to get to 30 reps, 40 reps, you start thinking comp plans. Um, a lot of people start thinking about sales operations, sales enablement, uh, infrastructure that comes with a larger team. Um, when's the right time to think about that? And what are the first things you, you go out and look for? Yeah, I mean, it's if I think of my experiences, I think uh, operations, sales, and like at Sheet Mail, it, we had a small team. Uh, we we weren't doing a, a tremendous amount of deals, but the deals were in the millions. So I personally could invest a lot of time in a team, very senior team, kind of knew what they were doing. Um, so we had a sales um, a Salesforce admin. Uh, to help with all the data and the, and the analytics, but uh, we never invested in a dedicated trainer. Like, I don't think we, we really needed one given the, like, support we had from the rest of the organization. And this was, like, 20, 20 25 yeah, reps? Like about 18 to 22, depending on the quarter and kind of hiring cycles. Um, Offer Pop, on the other hand, uh, was, was much different. It was, um, uh, it was a high volume. We did about 2,000 transactions a year. Um, we had a big team. Uh, a lot of volume, a lot of hiring in a short period of time. And, uh, you know, I think this is, you know, talking about things that, like, I wish I would have known then that I know now is, is like, I, I totally waited too late to, um, uh, to think about operations. Like, I started, and it was very much like, Wendell, our, our founder, is like, hey, we, we've got the green light. We just raised some money. Like, go hire like crazy. And the focus was on hiring, growing the team. Next thing I know, I found myself managing directly 19 people, uh, 15 of who started within the last three months. And uh, that, was, um, that was not fun. Um, but, um, but, but I think like very quickly, it's like, OK, I need, to, I need to really correct this. And then thereafter, having gone through that, and it took a while to kind of dig out of that and hire the right management structure and layers and, and all that stuff. But, but then going forward, it was always like, okay, my team is X right now. What is the growth? And, and this is scaling, so I assume everyone here is growing sales teams or, or, or will be. Uh, is thinking about what does the team look like double the size or even triple the size if you're you know, a couple reps? And what type of support do you need? So for me, it was a director of sales operations, someone that was uh, more than, like I had a Salesforce admin, but I needed someone who was more proactive from an analytical perspective 
and bringing like analyzing the data, analyzing comp, doing all of the numbers work that could I could just trust to like just figure this stuff out. Um, and then, you know, we uh, the other thing I wish we would have done is hired like a dedicated trainer um, sooner. Uh, sooner, actually, um, period. Um, we never ended up hiring a, a trainer. And I think we had the benefit of, of pulling from a lot of resources uh, from around the organization. Um, but it's still, like, it's still not the same of having someone that's literally like a teacher focused on sales-related, product sales-related curriculum and, and, and such. So, um, so I think that like, the answer is like wherever you are today, put a two or three X on top of that and think about the structure that you need. Because when we were at 45, like, I, I, my infrastructure was ready for 100. So um, like, I was never going to have that, <laughs> that problem again. This is too painful. Cool. Let's uh, turn to the audience. Does anyone have a question? Here we go. Hi. Uh, you mentioned making the first few enterprise sales for your company. And in my experience, larger corporations require like a more fleshed out product where smaller to medium sized companies will be more willing to work with an early company. So how do you think about the strategy between saying we want to be an enterprise company so let's just look for enterprise deals versus starting to look for small and medium sized deals so that you can eventually do enterprise deals? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I, I guess the, the question is without knowing like the product that you're <laughs> talking about, but like the question is, is there a way to break down the solution that you offer into a more narrower scope where you can go into that enterprise organization and maybe not do everything you wish like you will be able to do in a year from now or two years from now, but what can you do today and you know, can you focus on it? I think that's, you know, at, at Upside, like, that's exactly what we're doing. We're, like, we're now working on enterprise opportunities, and we've got a long, you know, product roadmap of things that we want to build. Um, they're not, you know, they're on a list of, you know, <laughs> stuff, right? But we have enough where we can go into there and deliver data and analytics and, and kind of, you know, through spreadsheets and bubblegum, deliver value um, but, but set the right expectation. They're like, hey, we're going to deliver value for this one thing, but over the course of time, we will expand to cover X, Y, and Z. So, um, you know, that, that's how, like, I think we've, I've done it over the course of my career, and uh, uh, it's, it's working for us now. And so maybe expanding on that question, it's, it's really, can you sell to enterprise if the product wasn't built for enterprise? Or if the product is going to be built for enterprise, but it's too early where enterprise companies are like, eh, we're not ready for this. And a, and a mid-market is? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit easier to get mid-market company to say, um, you know, we're only 30 or 40 salespeople or, or whatever, we'll, we'll try this and work with you and help you build the product, um, where I think larger corporations are less willing to do so. Did you tackle deals that were too big for OfferPop? Or, or even cheetah mail deals that just ended up being too complex or too big too early on? Uh, no, because I think we, we carved, I mean, like OfferPop, for example, right? Like, we, we had a, a, it's a social campaigns platform, right? So we had that tool, but we had this vision of a larger suite with data and analytics and, and other, other things. So we just, we, we narrowed the scope, right, down to something that, we know that we could deliver into that organization. We know they'll be happy. Uh, like Unilever at, at OfferPop was one of our, our larger clients. And, you know, we picked, we didn't work with every single brand around the world. Like we picked a couple brands that were willing to be, um, uh, you know, guinea, not guinea pigs, but like willing to take a risk for us. And we, you know, we delivered value to them. But you know, we get in there with that one thing, and then it's like, oh, and by the way, we can do this now, and then we can do this now, and hey, can you introduce it to another brand? So if you're selling it to salespeople, and, it, and it's, you know, we were talking to uh, the guy from Forbes here, um, but like they, there we go, <laughs> right in front of my face. But they were saying 90 salespeople. So there's teams within Forbes that are much smaller. So it's like, can you pick a team and say, hey, I'm going to go in and pilot this to one of the teams? And I, hopefully you pick someone who's managing that team that's a little more entrepreneurial, a little more like 
willing to see what's out there, I think, because you need a little bit of that at, at the enterprise. But you know, if you're going to deliver value and you're going to help them hit their number or do whatever your product is going to do, then you should, you know, why would they not try it? And you could narrow the scope to whatever you need it, whatever your product supports. But it sounds like you didn't sell too far out ahead of the product. No. No, because, like, you're going to lead to, I mean, that's just, it's just, like, future selling is a tr slippery slope in, in that, you know, at least in my career, products always like, hey, it's going to be out in Q2. Well, guess what? That's Q3 and a half. Uh, so you, you also want to manage client expectations. And, like, you know, I, I think in this world of, of buying, and especially now with others, like, uh, 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 like uh, G2 and the Yelp sites for pro like they very quickly you could get a bad reputation and I think a lot of people talk like I've sold into marketers and I have a lot of friends who are marketers just did an event about a month and a half ago uh, with a bunch of like senior marketers and they're they're like yeah we talk to each other all the time like you know what works what doesn't what what products are you looking at and you know that's that's where word of mouth happens and you know you want to make sure you deliver on that. Cool. We've got another question from the audience. So my question is, uh, we're, we're a Series B uh, company. We're selling an enterprise product uh, primarily within retail. And we made the decision to outsource our demand generation slash sales development team right now. We have six enterprise sellers, and um, we made that decision. How do we think about what's the right time to bring that in-house, if at all? And what are the criteria we should be thinking about um, for when to justify bringing that in-house? Uh, yeah, I mean, my experience with that is I, I, like I've, I've tested, like, hey, let's try this for a couple weeks, the outsourced, like, lead gen model. I've never found it to be as good as having it in-house. Um, never. Um, because I think a, a number of things, like, number one, uh, you know, like, I, the, the, the BDR teams, right, as, as like, they're known, SDR, BDRs, they, um, like I always looked at them as like they really in many ways are are a feedback channel of like what's working and what's not, what objections are you getting? So my like if my manager who's managing that team or if I'm managing them directly, like it's really important for me to on a weekly basis, if not if not like immediately after they get one, it's like why are people saying no? What is the feedback? And 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 then I can coach on that. And the question is of having another organization I don't have no idea what the setup is if you know who those those the people who are actually doing the calling what they're doing how they're saying it I don't know like it's a it's a really big feedback channel and then when I I don't know like when I look at the economics of it like it's it's um it's it, it, it's not that like in the long run based on the productivity of of that those channels it's not like a huge cost savings uh, at least that may have changed like I haven't looked at it in a while and I know there's like a lot of new stuff. I get emails about it like every week, but um, you know I, I don't. I wouldn't go that far. I think what what I would outsource is is like the list generation. Like help me. I want to target every CTO uh, in the Fortune 300, five, whatever. Or you're selling at the retail. Who are the CMOs? Who are the VP of marketing? Who are the VP of e-commerce? What is their email address? What is their phone number? I want that. Good outsource, good way, like good use of outsourcing overseas, like cheap to inexpensive. Um, but as soon as it's time to reach out to them, I want that. In, me personally, like I want that in house. So let, let's build on that question and maybe broaden it. Um, when's the right time to use SDRs, and where do you see SDRs uh, maybe going wrong in sales organizations today? Uh, well, the, I mean, the right time to use. I mean. And as soon as you start selling, I, guess, I mean, like, so uh, right now, like, I'm, I'm doing most of the, the selling. Uh, we have uh, a couple folks who are in that capacity, work very closely with me, and, uh, you know, helping me get in front of, of, of opportunities. So it could be as early as founder selling? Yeah, well, absolutely. absolutely. And then for other, did you set that up at OfferPop, the SDRs? Yeah, we had, we had a couple, but we built the team out. I think at its largest, it was, I don't know, maybe 12, 15, 15 people. Um, you know, I think just generally speaking at, at scale, uh, my view on, on, on that channel is, um, like, when used appropriately, I think it's, it can be very effective. Um, 
And the way I've always approached it is, and it, pretty much the both, the same at, at Cheetah Melon uh, and, uh, and Offer Pop, um, is like I, I think of it of, of, of like, okay, as a salesperson, you know, I've always sold products that were worth, like it was not the same price to everyone, right? So we could sell a deal to Kohl's at Cheetah Melon for three and a half million dollars. We could sell something to uh, Paragon Sports for 75K. So what I'm doing for my team at, at an aggregate level is I'm defining, like, who are the top 100, well, depending on the size of the team, but, like, per rep, who are your top 30 to 50, comp, like, prospects, right? And those are yours, right? Because they're the ones, like, you close one of them, they'll take care of your quarter, could take care of your year if it's, if it's big enough. And that's, like, to me, it's just too risky to outsource completely to a, to a, a BDR. So you require your AEs to do some of that work for the kind of most important stuff in their book? Yeah, absolutely. Because like, and especially in an enterprise level, I mentioned Kohl's, like Kohl's literally took two and a half years to get into the opportunity. Two and a half years of, hey, how did the Packers do this 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 week? You know, what's <laughs> going on with the Brewers? Like, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of relationship building. And, and I think that helped because when it was time to, to, to get the ball rolling, I was able to stay consistent with them for, uh, for, the, for that contact for a very long time. Where I think BDRs play a role is, is, is partnering with for those larger accounts. So is there an opportunity to go and help me, help me map the organization or help me do things where you in, in accelerate the, the relationship? Help me find research, things like that, that I'm, I'm willing to give you like meeting credit for to do that work because it's very, very valuable. And then I think the things that I've always had um, BDRs work on was very much like, okay, once you get from uh, account 31 to account, you know, let's say the middle, two, middle third, um, they're the ones that's like, hey, let her rip because those deals um, typically are, are faster moving. They're not as strategic. Um, it's a good training ground. I don't really, there's a higher volume of them. I don't care if they, I mean, care, but like I don't care as much. If they have a bad call, um, you know, they're learning, we're learning, and, uh, you know, it works well. And then over time, like if a BDR gets good enough, you obviously want to promote them into a, into a sales role. So I think like that's, that's how I've always structured it. And, um, you know, it's turned out okay for me. Any major mistakes you would have, you'd go back and do right? After having done it, I think um, I read a lot about this of like how to how to compensate uh, that organization, and you know I think like I, I don't know I've gone through the trials and tribulations of putting the wrong uh, again like salespeople BDRs included are put a plan and they're gonna execute to it, and putting like a, a just a hey set up x number of meetings. You get a, you know, it just it was the wrong thing, and and what we ultimately changed to at at, at OfferPop was a point system, so that certain deals or certain opportunities were more valuable to us. Certain industries, certain segments, uh, based on our pricing structure, certain deals were larger, and putting a, a point system so that there was value to them to be able to 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 hit their numbers faster when they're delivering more value to the to the sales organization. Like I think that's that was probably the the biggest the biggest missing correction. Cool. Any, any more from the audience? I've got the next one lined up, and we'll go, come back to the audience in a couple minutes uh, after some of my questions. So let's, let's shift gears. We talked a little bit about you know, founders, sales leaders, kind of running the whole organization. Let's talk a little bit about sales management, because I think a lot of people in the room uh, are directly managing people. What was your first step into sales management, and uh, what were the, the painful early learnings? Yeah, so my, my first step was um, going from an individual contributor uh, to a, a, a regional manager and uh, managing a team of you know, like five or six people that uh, I had worked with for three, four, five years um, in, in various capacities. And I went from being a friend to a manager. And I think going through that, um, that dynamic. And, you know, the thing, the thing about... I think my approach to sales is is one in which like like I, I break sales down to two things like well part of part one is like a, it's a math problem and part two is a psychology problem and I think 
I was always very, um, uh, very much a fan of, of Salesforce and CRM and tracking data and, you know, like it was a pain in the ass, you know, back in the day, it's much easier now, but, but um, it, it gave me insight. Like I knew at the end of the week or at the end of a month or at the end of a quarter, like what I was doing. So I, as a salesperson, had very, very good understanding of my metrics. And then when I was, I was promoted to managing now a bunch of my friends in many cases, it's like, okay, I'm not going to assume that they do things exactly as I do. Uh, I am not going to force like my process on them. What I'm going to do is, is take the same metrics and the same analytics that I use as an individual contributor and apply that to every single person. Uh, I know that they, you know, because I was friends with them, I know they were not like really using CRM as a, as a tool. So I think for for me is helping them understand why to use it, why it's important. But then like everyone is different. Like every every salesperson has has strengths and weaknesses. And it, I wasn't. I made a very early decision as a manager that I'm not going to shove a process or 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 something that I think is right down their throat. Obviously, you have goals to hit. Um, but I can look at the metrics and say, okay, you know, Joe Smith is not converting, you know, discovery calls as well. Let me go in there and see, like, the psychology of it. Like, what are you, what are you asking? What are, you, how are you interpreting what someone says? How is that different from, you know, Patty Smith? Like the, the next, like, so, so getting a sense of like where everyone's conversion, where they're, where they're hurting, and really focusing on those things. And and I think it 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 served us well. I think the the team was like. Oh, great, now we got this guy, like, you know, and, and like, I looked at it as like, look, I'm working for you now, like, my goal is to make sure that you crush your number, and, uh, you know, taking that, like, no ego approach, I think worked, um, worked very well, and, and they saw the numbers, and they saw the improvements, and they saw the focus, so it was, it was very tangible, and, uh, and, and very black and white. So it sounds like the idea is use the numbers to help you figure out where each individual seller uh, needs help. Is that a fair? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, like, I think, um, I don't know, like, like I, it, it's, even now at our business, it's just a handful of us, but like, we have more metrics than you could, you could possibly imagine. Um, and uh, I think, you know, for me, you know, using OfferPop as an example, where we were like at, at our, you know, at the largest size, about, about 45 people, um, I had managers who had managers who managed reps. And but I had the right instrumentation of the dashboard and the reporting and the metrics to like understand what a, a salesperson who I may not have talked to for, I tried not to, to go this long, but a month or so, um, I knew I could look and in a couple minutes know what they're not doing right. Because I, I as a manager understood the sales process, number one, I understood the product, I understood the market, and I understood what the metrics meant um, to the sales process. And I think like that's, that's something that, as I have an opportunity to talk to a lot of, of, of sales managers, like I, I feel like that's something that a lot of people miss. Like they, yeah, we have numbers, but you know, they're important for a week and then they like go away or it's like, okay, well, you know, we're, 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 we're not getting enough leads. It's like, okay, well, what's your close rate? 10%. It's like, okay, probably getting enough leads. Like it's, you know, something else is wrong there. So I think like really diving into the, the diagnostic of, of what the, the metrics are telling you as, as a place to, to, as a manager, to spend your time. Once, once you get into that psychology, it sounds like you're, you're coaching. You're watching them sell, and you're saying, all right, the numbers told me your discovery was, was weaker than, the peer, than your peers. I'm going to help you do that. What are you doing when it kicks into coaching, and how are you approaching the phase that's psychology and not math? Yeah, I, th I think it's... it's um, I mean, it's number one as a, as a manager, right? Like you, you're a, a mentor and a, and a coach. So w what are you going to coach them on? Like it, to me, like I always felt like I needed to be the best product expert. I needed to know the market better than anyone. I needed to have empathy for our buyers. Uh, and I needed to do that better than anyone. Like that's like from a, from a, a, a just a, a personal management like training perspective, I was more interested in that stuff than like the latest, you know, challenger sale framework or, or things like that. Because at the end of the day, like, I know that, that we're selling things to people, we're solving problems. And if I don't understand that as a manager, I can't coach my team. So when it comes time to like coach, 
it's not like, hey, you need more leads or you need to close more deals or you need to generate. It's like, well, let's look and like, what are you, like, think about the buyer. Like, what do they care about? Are you asking the right questions? Are you delivering value? Are you spending time seeing what's going on in the market? Like, it's, like that's what selling is about is, is consulting and solving problems. And I think like me as a manager, my job is to go into, the, into those one-on-one -on -one sessions or sit on calls and, and like it's, you know, it's like I have to be delivering value, like feedback immediately. And it's like I don't wait until uh, one-on-ones. It's like let's have a call. After the call, hey, like think about this. Talk, you know, you didn't ask this question. Um, they answered it this way, but you should think about this because here's what's going on in the market. Like that type of stuff is... That's how sales, that's how managers add value, in, in my opinion. What do you think um, other managers might misunderstand about the coaching process? That maybe you've made that mistake and you've cleared it up, or you've just seen other parts of the organization do it well? Yeah, I mean, I think like the, the managers and, and that I've had a chance to, to get to know or, or, or kind of analyze, like it, um, what they what they may not do well is um, is is what I was just saying. Like learn the pro like I'm going to come into an organization as a manager. Cool. I'm going to sit and manage a dashboard and look at a bunch of Salesforce reports and and then just like hey, you need to do this. But that like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of tech like sales has changed a lot. I mean, there's a there's a gazillion and one like technology platforms. And there's more data that's in your face and on TV screens around the like than ever. So, like, salespeople get it. Like, I need to close more. I need to close more deals. I'm number six on the team this month. Like, you don't have to tell them that. Like, they should, they should have 50 signs that, that, that tell them that. But it's really, like, how do I go from number six to number one? What are the things that I'm not doing right? And unless you know the, the sales process, the product, the market, the, the why people buy, like, what they care about, the consideration set that they're evaluating versus other, like, you're not going to be as valuable as a, as a, as a mentor and a, and a manager. Let's take it back to the audience for questions. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, Salesforce is obviously one of the most scalable cloud-based tracking services that you can use, but it's so clunky and it's not great for startups who you don't necessarily need an interface that deep. Have you noticed any other databases that you think still deliver that kind of value or can scale with a company without having to start off with something that sort of corporate? Um, you know, it's funny, like starting, like starting Upsider, like I, I use that as, as an opportunity, actually, it's funny you asked that question of, of, okay, we need a CRM system. Let me go into the market. I've used Salesforce for pretty much my whole career and let me go into the market and evaluate other tools. Interesting stuff out there for sure, but maybe it's just cause I'm old now and like I, I'm set in my ways, but we ended up, like, cool stuff, no doubt. Like, um, I don't need to get into, like, naming, like, different platforms, but I ended up just using Salesforce because I tend to go very deep very quickly into the data, and it's just, I know how to use it, and, and it's, it is pretty powerful, and I think sometimes overwhelming, but, like, once you get to know it, it's, it's, it's not, it, for me, it's not, worth, like, they're the leader. If you start integrating other products, they're going to integrate with Salesforce. Like, it, it's just... As well as sales. <laughs> Sorry. What are your favorite interview questions and any best practices on not selecting the right people to interview? Because we'll use Upsider for that. But uh, just running people through an effective candidate experience process. Um, no, it's a it's a it's a great question, and I think like I'm I'm looking at uh, you know whether I'm hiring for my team or kind of doing what we've been doing over the last year and a half. But I, I'm looking for, like, also have an opportunity to talk to a lot of hiring managers about, like, what are you looking for? And, and a very common thing is, like, hey, I, I want someone who's doing what we're doing, what, what we're doing, and I want experience in that, right? And I think, like, I was the same way in, in thinking that. Just, I'm just talking about a, of a profile for a second, then I can get into the, into the questions. But, like, I, I, like, if you think about, like, I'm going to hire someone who's um, doing the same thing and successful doing it. So that means you're going to hire from a competitor. Like what top rep at a competitor is going to move to another competitor unless there's like something like catastrophically going wrong at, at a business. Or you're going to pay, you're, you're, you'll overpay them by, you'd have to pay them by over 2x. 
because they're probably in a sweet spot and they have all the great accounts and things like that. So, so I think like I look for like what, like the dynamics of my sales process. Like who are who are other companies, businesses, salespeople that uh, align with my sales process? So what's my average order value? Who am I selling to? How many leads do they have to generate? What is the is this like a, hey, read from a script and just say yes? Or is this like, hey, ask a bunch of questions. Who knows what they answer? Uh, but you have to think on your feet. Like, I think those are the things that I, I think about. And then I'm looking to map that to the rest of the ecosystem of, of salespeople. So um, that's kind of the thesis of, of our, our business. Like, and when, we, when I have someone come into the interview, then it's really about um, getting into the into that sales process. And I want to understand, right, because I, assuming you have a team and you know what you're, you know, kind of what works and what doesn't, you see how people are successful and how they're not. So I don't have like, hey, this is the magic question to ask, but I'm interested in like, give me a rundown of like, start from like the day you started to today in, a, in five minutes or less. Like, what is, like, how did you get ramped up? What is your process? What do you do? What do you care about in, in a sales? Like, th that's what I want to understand first and foremost. And then it's the question of like, the, the best salespeople that I've, I've managed or I've had a chance to, to get to know are, are curious. They are consultants. Like, they care about the client's business. They care about the market. They want to educate themselves on the market. So, in a first interview, I want to get a sense for, like, how much of that homework did you actually do, right? Because, like, if you're, if you're not passionate going in to meet, let's say, you for the first time, right, where they're trying to make an impression, like, why would, like, what other time are they going to invest? So I think, like, it, it's, it's understanding what their sales process actually is in their own words, because I think it's also, like, how articulate are they and how can they, they talk about that? And then, and then are they curious? Are they, are they, um, are they, Will they be product experts, industry experts? And then, you know, what, like, what, what you know, various questions around, like, drive and what makes them, why do they want this? What's, you know, what's going to make them competitive? How were they competitive in the past? How have they failed? How have they recovered? Those kind of things. Like, those are, those are tend to be, like, the, in some form or another, the, the topics that I, I tend to cover. Um, and then, uh, you know, like, I, I tend to not overthink, like, sales hiring. It's, you know, they either work out or they don't. And even the best, you know, what is it, like the best, you know, it's a 30% average churn rate in the, in the industry. So it's not everyone is going to work out. And, and it's not because they're not smart and they're not good people. It's just, you know, maybe there's some sort of mismatch and that didn't really uncover until they were doing the job for, you know, two months, three months, two quarters, you know, that kind of stuff. All right, we're going to go to the last question over here with Charlie. Uh, so I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so I'm curious, you mentioned at the start that a lot of people building software for the first time, especially SaaS, uh, often are sort of developers, engineers. What are sort of the common mistakes that you see engineers when they're learning that sales process for the first time? And what sort of your recommended reading sort of for them to make sure that they can make the transition from pure dev to, to learning those sales skills? Uh, yeah, is, this, I, is this dev founder? This, this, I may be a dev founder. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's... Uh, how do you we, teach we, your we, dev founder how to sell? Um, no, I think, I, think, uh, I think developers and engineers are underestimated as sales, salespeople because, like, I think the, you know, back to kind of what I was just talking about with Sam of, like, the, the best salespeople, salespeople are the ones who understand the most about the industry, understand the most about the client, understand the problems, and, you know, as, a, as, a, as an engineering founder... I mean, that's ultimately, you're, you're building something to solve a problem. So you, know, you, you probably know it better than anyone because that's all you're thinking about, you know, 24-7. I think what, what ends up happening, and this happened to me, is when I, um, when I started talking about what we're doing for the first time with clients, like, my head is, is in it so deep, then it's like, oh, we're doing, like, you know, like in the weeds, and they're like, oh, there's actually like processing, and, then, and they're like, well, like... I, I just need it. I just need a tool. Like, help me like find people or not, and uh, and then it's so. I think like what what I would recommend is like, you know, is 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 making sure you're, you know you're you're moving up how you talk about the solution to a level that is 
not like 30,000 feet, but like is high enough where you're talking about that, like what is your problem? Here's how you solve that problem. Not like here's the, the underlying tech, unless that's important as part of that conversation, maybe it is, but, um, but really about how you're solving the problem. And you know, as long as you can communicate that at the highest level possible and they're like, sounds like you're gonna sign it, let's, let's give this a shot. Then I think that's good, but, but a lot of a lot of a lot of times, a lot of founders, like it's it, especially engineering, is just you're you're way too deep, and you don't need to like you need to take it up a couple levels. And I think you mentioned cool. curiosity, which I found lots of developers uh, have in spades. So I think don't tone that down, right? Go into those meetings and ask those questions that you're naturally curious about because you'll get answers. It's going to help you build your business. All right, guys, that's the last question. Um, I'm going to have Eric come up and give a quick uh, heads up on the next event that we're going to be throwing. But thanks again for coming out. And then we'll be sticking around afterwards for beer, pizza, and uh, more talking. Yeah, let's give it up for Josh. Thank you. And for co-hosting Evan, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for coming out tonight. I thought you guys did a great job. Um, our next event is going to be October 10th. Um, and actually, it's going to be with Craig Rosenberg from Topo, and it's going to be a pretty great one. Uh, we've got our, our events in order now. All this is available, including this video, at buildingthesalesmachine.com. Uh, we've got all of our content, all the videos, a bunch of articles, and a bunch of Q&A with um, a bunch of industry sales leaders and interesting VP of sales who um, don't get a chance to come up on stage but actually uh, put out a lot of great content. Um, quick announcement from our side if anybody's looking to get involved to get their name out there and help our organization we're always looking for people to help us from an event standpoint from a content standpoint and administrative and logistics uh this is a great opportunity for um an ae or an sdr who is looking to do more and shine in their organization uh so with that we'll get back to pizza and beer if anybody does have uh wants to raise their hand and help us out see myself evan or dave uh, or Sam. And um, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks again, guys. Appreciate it.